Well, I guess thanks for having me. It's a fantastic turnout. Room's nearly full. It's my first time in Perth. I've been here for a grand total of about 12 hours. So, you know, it's going well so far. So I hope you have a good time today. Um, as Mark said, I've been with Thoughts about nine years. I'm techie, I guess. I, I still call myself a developer. Uh, and I still try and write code wherever I can. I found myself um, sort of straddling the development and operations side because I like building systems rather than just writing code. Um, so I end up dealing with also the operational side of the world, so infrastructure automation uh, and all that sort of monitoring and you know, log aggregation and rolling around in Ethernet cables. I never roll around in Ethernet cables, but it's been known. Um, but I also spend a lot of time looking at architecture and the design of systems. Um, and when sort of the continuous delivery thing came out and we were talking more to clients about it, I went into a lot of clients to help them move towards continuous delivery and found that all too often the challenges they were facing were not things to do with infrastructure automation or CI servers. They were actually more fundamental. The designs of the systems themselves did not lend themselves to being changed rapidly or in a low risk fashion. So the talk today is all about that. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to start at the beginning, really, and, and talk about why rapid release is important. Um, probably because you know some people understand that. We would all like to release our software faster because, well, well, we get to find out if it works. That's a good thing. You know, some of us make money from features. That's a good thing. So get that software out there. Um, what do we mean by rapid? Well, we mean you know faster than once or two every two years. That would be good. Um, I'm pretty sure many of you have applications on your phone that get updated, you know, five or six or seven or eight times a year. Um, but for many of us, the organizations we work in, we're not able to do the same sorts of things. When we can release our software, we can learn, we can de-risk things. And I'm not going to go overboard about this because I'm hoping most of you would understand that, otherwise you probably wouldn't have come to a talk called Designing for Rapid Release. Uh, but I can go into more this later. Um, probably start, though, thinking about how we sit down and consider the designs of our systems in the first place. The approach I like to use when taking an existing system and thinking about how it's going to change, or designing a system from scratch for, let's say, a greenfield system, is to use sort of guiding criteria to shape what we're going to build. These might be constraints or they might be principles. They could be constraints and things that we just have to do. So we might have to be beholden to certain technology choices because that's what we've already got available to us. Or they might be principles in terms of how we're going to structure our systems, like it's going to be a REST-based system. And whether or not we know it, these principles and these constraints are what we have in our heads. And sometimes they're explicit and sometimes they're implicit, but they guide how we design our systems and how we evolve our systems. And probably the things I'm going to talk about now are fairly familiar to you. The sorts of principles, the sorts of criteria we'd use to govern the design, like scaling. What kind of application are we building? How is our application going to scale? Are we a startup that's expecting explosive growth when we get tech crunched or digged? Or are we a new site, a current affairs site, where our load is going to be variable based on events that we can't possibly predict? Or are we a, a site maybe that would evolve with seasonal sales, where we expect higher sales in the summer and lower sales in the winter because we sell barbecues, so we might want more elasticity? What about our durability of service? We might care about how available our system is in certain outage scenarios. That's going to change the design of our system. Do we need to build it with high availability in mind? We might think about geographical constraints. Where are my users? Do I have to put my service closer to where my users are to give them the types of response that they require? I have compliance issues. I deal with clients sometimes in the retail sector having to deal with things like PCI. PCI level one can actually often impose some constraints on the design of your system and the technology choices that you can make. And technology is a great one. What if I want to mix in Ruby and Rails with my .NET stack? Well, that's probably going to push me towards having separate services, for example the performance, the latency of the system. All of these things are probably things that you have considered actively when changing the design of your system or building a system from scratch. But how often have you ever stopped and thought, how do we make our system easy to release? And what are the things we need to do to make it easy to release? 
In my experience, it's very rare that this is given any attention whatsoever. It's often lip service paid to it. And we only discover six months or a year down the line that we've got a system that's very, very hard to change. What we're going to talk about today is what we can do around designing systems that make it very easy to make the change in the first place, a bug fix or a small feature change, whatever that might be. We'll talk about making it very quick to deploy that change and also how we reduce the risk of that deployment. This is really important. If we can't manage the risk of our deployments and our releases of our software, we're not going to want to release. You know, it's going to be people are going to shout at us. We're going to break stuff a lot. So we need to be able to actively manage the risk of releasing our software to allow us to go faster and more frequently in our releases of our software. We use an example throughout the whole presentation today. Let's consider the music shop. So I'm a, a brand new startup, and I think the future is definitely in the distribution of physical media. Um, this digital stuff, it's all pipe dreams, and the future is definitely selling 8-track cassettes and CDs out world. Here's my, my first cut of my system. It's the Music Shop version 1. And I have a recommendation system. Uh, so when I pour uh, Blue Juice and Silver Chair into my shopping basket, it should recommend something similar to me. But for reasons known only to me, it keeps recommending I buy Peter Andre albums. Now, clearly, that's not a great user experience, and I'm getting quite annoyed, and lots of Silverchair fans now hate me. So I find the fix. It's a one-liner left there by a contractor who likes Peter Andre, and I make that fix, and I need to deploy that change. Now, I, I maybe though it's a one-line change. Maybe I find that change straight away. But let's look at my big monolithic system here. I'm trying to make out one small change, I have to redeploy my entire system. That small change, the whole system has to change. This could require downtime. It's a high impact change. A high impact change is, by definition, high risk. Not great. Think about a different situation. Let's imagine my system is actually made up of components. And the same change, that same one line change, only affects one of those components. Now, if I can make that change and only deploy that one component, the impact of that change has been reduced. The risk of that change has been reduced. And if the risk of that change has been reduced, I can make those changes with more confidence. So, the same sort of change can result in very different impacting releases of the software. And so what I'm going to focus on is how do I limit the impact of a change that I might need to make so I can make these changes more effectively. The same change, very different deployments. The other thing to bear in mind, although I'm not going to talk too much about this, is that what you want to be doing is making small releases. The reason for this is you might want to make a big change, but if you make it in one big fell swoop, that again is a very big, high impactful change. The risk of a big change, even if it's within one component, is significantly higher than a small change. Now, if I want to make a big change like this, Instead, what I want to look at is how do I make that change in small incremental steps, building that out feature by feature or component by component. The reason for this is beyond the fact I might end up going in a different direction I thought even in the first place, and this is really a lot of what we do Agile anyway, but every single release becomes a rollback point, a risk management mechanism. A small change to roll out is a small change to roll back. I also gather data. How is my system behaving? How is my release process working? And also, if I'm doing lots of small releases, I have a release process that's pretty good. So basically, small incremental releases kind of rock. So uh, what do we do to allow small changes to be made in our system? Let's think of our music shop. So here's my recommendation library. This is the uh, offending line of code is maybe in my recommendation library. Uh, you know, I've got other libraries that make up my music shop. So I've got an invoice creation library to create my invoices, well-named things. They say naming things in computing is hard. I don't believe them. Um, I'm probably using a really shitty language like Java, so I have to have a string utils library. There's normally at least 15 of these lying around, right? I can't extend it. This is useful. This is a step in the right direction. I've got these small components inside my big service. These are fairly easy to reason about. If my recommendation system isn't working and is misbehaving, 
the bug is probably going to be in the recommendation library. So I go and look in the recommendation library and I make that change. Easy to reason about, easy to target the change. That's good. That's a good start. Small units like this also have fast turnaround cycles if you think about, say, continuous integration uh, and build pipelines. So when I change the recommendation library, I'll run all the unit tests of the recommendation library. But if I'm then integrating that into a whole as part of my deployment, I may not need to run all of the unit tests of my invoice creation or my string utils library. So that's good. So the times when my build pipeline has also been reduced. But it's not all the way there. So let's think about our music shop. And inside it, I've got the recommendation library version, 134. And so I make the bug fixes and maybe some performance improvements. And I want to roll that new version of the library out. And I want to roll out version 200 with my fixes in it and these changes. The problem is I this is a library. It's a statically linked library. This might be a jar file inside a war file or something like that. I still have to redeploy my whole system, my whole service here, the monolithic music shop version 2 needs to get redeployed. So this is a problem because I've got a statically linked library and I'm still having to redeploy the entire application. So it's not all the way there then. Let's look at some other approaches. So here we have the music shop and now instead I have my recommendation library is actually not a library but a separate service. So it's a separate process boundary and the music shop talks the recommendation library over a clear service interface like this. Now I want to deploy a new version of my service, or well, I can bring that up, and I just repoint the link. Depending on how the communication is done, this might be a real-time change. I may be able to do this just by going in and flicking a flag, changing a configuration setting uh, in the service registry, changing a configuration file, it could be repointing DNS, changing a JMX entry, but I can flick that flag and that could happen in real time with no downtime. I can also do some interesting things here. So I've reduced the impact. I haven't had to take all of my functionality down to replace one unit. I can actually further manage the risk of that deployment. So when I bring up my new version of my library, what if I bring it up at my, at my, my service? What if I bring it up at the same time as the old service, but don't point anyone to it just yet? Well, I could run some tests against it. I've probably got tests that run as part of my build process. Why don't I now run this against the, newly, the new version of my service before I've actually put it into production use? I could actually go and eyeball it, do a showcase. Many of you might do a showcase at the end of iteration. What if you're doing that on the next version of the system that's going to go live? And then when you're happy that that's the one you want, you redirect it. And if it turns out as a problem that you find that late, just don't redirect the links. This is actually a general principle of separating the deployment of your software from the release of your software. We've deployed the application, the service, in a production environment, but we haven't yet released it to our users. This is a risk mitigation mechanism. And by having a separate service and being able to deploy them side by side, I'm able to do that separation, separate deployment from release. This is actually uh, something that's called uh, blue-green deployments in um, the continuous delivery book. It was written by Jez Humble and uh, Dave Farley. I don't have a picture of Dave Farley. He's much better looking than Jez. Have we got a book to give away? There's a book on the table over there. I'm assuming if that's, no, if, if that's not somebody's here, I'm going to give it away later. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of good stuff in the continuous delivery book. Uh, there's patterns like this blue-green deployment. It talks a lot about build pipelines in general, the principles behind continuous delivery. I'm not going to talk in detail about that, lots of presentations online. Um, but nonetheless, blue-green deployment is one of the things that's talked about as a way of managing the deployment of your systems and doing that in a fairly uh, well-managed way. So that's a really nice idea. I can separate the deployment from the release of my service, managing the risk. But many of us face impediments in our organisations that stop those things from happening. Think of a few things that we might do a few decisions we might make about design or constraints in our environment that might stop us from being able to separate out the release uh, from the deployment from the release. This is a fun one. Uh, how many of you do Java web development or .NET web development in the room? Okay, probably about half. The rest are in denial, probably, or lucky. Um, there's a nice pattern that the that Microsoft and Sun had around their web frameworks about how to handle session state that becomes a challenge when dealing with 
systems that you want to deploy. Um, so here's my user, and I'm using the music shop. And I am putting things in my basket. Very simple. Now, my basket is a piece of state. And because I've followed the very clearly <coughs> written API documents from Sun or from Microsoft or Oracle, as they are, I have a session object, and I save my session object. That becomes a piece of state in memory. Uh, that's all very convenient because we were all too lazy to read the HTTP specification, which actually has the entry where it shows you how you store shopping cart in a cookie. Uh, instead, we use an expensive servlet container or you know, pay money to Microsoft to store it for us in a piece of server-side state. Now, these are challenging anyway in terms of scaling and resiliency, but there are challenges here as well when we want to release a new version of our software. If I'm storing this in memory, how do I deploy a new version of my music shop? That becomes a problem. I want to redirect my user to the new version of the system. I actually have to either decide to lose my state or migrate that state. So where possible, avoid stateful services. Holding memory in state often requires expensive proprietary software. It's a challenge around scaling, can kill your network, and is often better solutions around it. Cookies, for example, for shopping carts are not a terrible idea if you understand how cookies get sent. And actually, local storage now for HTML5 is pretty mature. There are lots of ways around this sort of problem. Expensive hardware. Less of a challenge now than it used to be, but many of us still work in environments where we have limited amounts of hardware available to us, especially where the cost of the same piece of hardware in a production environment might be much higher than the same piece of hardware in a development environment just because of how your support contracts work. So I don't have a spare box to run this service side by side to, so I can have it standing up next to my other services and so I can run tests against it. It's actually a nice pattern uh, called the circuit breaker that can help here. So the circuit breaker pattern in terms of services works exactly the same. No, it works similar to how the circuit breaker works in your house. Circuit breaker in your house, when too much electricity passes through it, it blows the connection to ensure that no more harm can be done to your house and the house isn't burned down. Circuit breakers around services work in a similar way. They're a way of saying, don't send any more traffic to this service because it's either not there or it's unhealthy. And it's a way of signaling to the consuming service that that thing's not available right now. So let's imagine I've got a circuit breaker between the music shop and the recommendation service. So here's my, my website up here. I've uh, got Queens of Stone Age, Take That and Snoop Dogg in my shopping basket, and I've been recommended to go and buy the brakes because the brakes are awesome. Um, that's great. New version's coming out. So how do I deploy it if I can't bring up a new piece of hardware, there's no space available on the existing system? How do I coexist that version and test it? Well, what I do is I blow the circuit breaker. So now, no traffic is being sent to that service. Clearly, at this point, I have to degrade my feature set to my users. So I can't recommend anything right now. It's a change to the service and to the system that people would see. I can then change the version of the recommended light that's, that's there, but no traffic's been sent to it yet. I can then run my tests, and when I'm happy again, I can reset that connection, and the recommendation stuff starts flowing again. Now, this seems like an awful lot of work to do to allow me to redeploy a service independently. Actually, the reason you do that is to build resilient systems. My service might be down because I'm redeploying it. My service could be down because of a network segmentation event, uh, a problem on the downstream system. If you're building distributed systems without circuit breakers in any way, you are going to have to deal with a cascading um, uh, failure problem. The circuit breaker is actually outlined really well in a book called um, Release It by Mike Nygaard. Uh, if I had my choice on what book to give every ThoughtWorks grad, it would be this book. Um, so Mike made loads of mistakes building systems uh, and then wrote them all down at the book and came up with all kinds of patterns. And so he talks about the circuit breaker pattern as a way that he used to actually mitigate cascading failures in the distributed systems he worked with. And using much the same semantics as, say, a, a health check might be on a load balancer, you do things like say, OK, I've had too many 500s coming from that service. I'm not going to send any more traffic there. Instead, I'm going to degrade my feature set to my outside users. So I've had to make a conscious effort and an understanding that that system is down. Therefore, I need to change the feature set I expose my customers. 
There's another way of doing something similar, but using asynchronous rather than synchronous communication. So in this example, I am sending requests, say, to a message bus, and I, my, in this world, my recommendation system, rather than being, say, a synchronous service, is an asynchronous worker. There are lots of good reasons to do asynchronous services. Um, they're actually a fairly uh, elegant way of scaling. Um, so here I've got my recommendation system, and it's sort of eating the messages, and it's sending back responses for via a callback mechanism. Now, in this world, if my recommendation system is taken offline, all that happens is my messages build up. Now, from the, the website's point of view, the music shop's point of view, it's kind of harder to tell now, is the service down or is it slow? And it's not as clear cut as to whether or not there's a problem. With a synchronous communication, I can either make the call or I can't. I get a yes, no straight away. Here, it's a bit more nuanced. And so often all you can say is, I'm waiting for recommendations. Can't get back to you right now. But then when I bring the system back up, it starts consuming again, the messages get written, uh, get eaten, and it goes back to recommending. Um, I would say in general, synchronous services are significantly easier to reason about and manage and require less in the way of middleware and state management. And so you should avoid asynchronous services if you possibly can, because they're painful. If you're going to do them, read this book, because uh, there's loads of great patterns in terms of how you manage this stuff. It will talk to you about things like message hospitals and competing consumer patterns. It will help you deal with the orchestration challenges. Uh, in general, always favour synchronous point-to-point -point communication over asynchronous communication. Your, your eyes will be simpler. So these are things and ways we could deal with the, I don't have enough hardware, how do I redeploy my services without affecting other services? So here I am, I'm in the world now, I'm, I'm going to rush off at this point, because I've drunk all my beer, and I'm going to go home, and tomorrow morning I'm going to start breaking my, my big monolithic system up into lots of little systems, and you'll be fine. Well, there are some pitfalls to look for. When you're sort of decomposing systems, there are some really common anti-patterns that we see time and again that can actually lead you to being worse off. So the first one is a, an anti-pattern I call the trifle. There's other names for this. Now, when I do this presentation abroad, I sometimes have to explain what a trifle is. I'm glad I'm in a civilised part of the world. Um, so here we are. I've got my music web shop. And so I've heard Sam, and Sam says, break up into services, and that's, that's what you want to do. And I've broken my services effectively horizontally. I've decided I'm going to take my persistent system and separate that off as a separate service. Now, this is a challenge. What is it we want to do? One of the drivers is when we make a change, we want to make it easy to make the change and easy to deploy the change. Now, what we really want to do is try and target changes where possible to being a single service. When you make separations like this and you make a change to business functionality, you'll more often than not find that a change, a simple change, can often ripple across two services. Now, if I have to manage deployment of two services in synchronization with each other, that's clearly worse off than I was before. You'll also find that services you split across horizontal technical boundaries like this, so you might see sort of facade and aggregating services as well, can often face these sorts of challenges. They can be very chatty. I work with one application that had this exact same split. It was a very well-known social media application. It's not as big as it used to be, but they had over 70 calls that could be made into the persistence layer, and they were making 25 of them just to render the home page to one back-end service. And they solved this by having an elaborate RPC batching mechanism, rather than thinking maybe we haven't actually split our system up in the right way. And that's actually a simple example. When you get these things that are three or four or five or six levels deep, where you've just effectively taken arbitrary technical barriers and split those across process boundaries, you end up with very highly coupled systems where changes often ripple across multiple levels of your system, becoming really painful to work with. And in that situation, the answer is actually to often recombine those services back up again. There's another anti-pattern called the spider. I have actually learned that naming things is actually quite hard and not very good at it. So if anyone's got better names for these things, I'm all ears. Um, so here's my CD ordering system. As I said, I'm, the wave of the future is physical media, media. I'm ordering my CDs. That's great. Off to a good start. I've got to talk to a white mail system. 
So white male is not, as I learnt uh, in 2004, the opposite of black male. White male is what we call the systems that send letters out to people. Little tip when doing a performance test, make sure you do not point your performance test at the production white male system. That's not good. Um, I've also got a data warehouse because data is very precious and you need to put it somewhere very, very safe that you can never get at it ever again. That's what the data warehouse is for. It's like, it should be a, called a vault. You can't get stuff out. I've got a third party supply to supply my third parties. And I've also got a finance system with all the money lives. And so I've got the CD ordering system in the middle that has a nice workflow system. I've probably done some business process modeling and I've baked that into my CD ordering system. And he says, you do that and then you do that and then you do that and, you, and then you do that. And what we have here is a very intelligent spider in the middle of the web who is the source of all truth. And we have four dumb systems sitting around. Let's think about what changes. The business come along, they may not change a feature. I'm always going to have to change the guy in the middle. Pretty risky, right? He's the one guy that knows everything about my system. And this is inherently the challenges that we face when people use workflow modeling or business process modeling for distributed systems. You end up with dumb systems and really smart systems become this tangled knot in the middle of it. And spiders in Australia are much more dangerous than they are in the UK. Um, so how do we f avoid those pitfalls and pitfalls like that? Uh, this is Ian Robinson, his next thought worker. Um, what is that thought worker? wrote a book called Rest in Practice with uh, Jim Webber, who used to live out here in Australia. And if you ever met him, you wouldn't forget him because he's a sweary old kid. Um, but he defined a service to me many years ago in a nice, succinct way, and he said it's a set of capabilities on an endpoint. Now, when Ian talked about capabilities, he was talking about capabilities the business would understand. A group of those capabilities grouped together on an endpoint. So think about what the capabilities might be with our music shop. The capability to add something to a cart to check out, to view the latest releases, uh, to search, uh, and to listen to previews. Now, these are all things that you would understand as probably being capabilities that the music shop's going to provide. These are capabilities that probably a non-technical person in the organization would understand as things that we would need to offer to our customers. Now, these things themselves, you can start grouping them together. Those of you that have done any, any work with domain-driven design have read Eric Evans' book, specifically the second half of the book, that's the more interesting part. When I first read domain-driven design, I thought the first half of the book was more interesting. So actually the second half. These are often what you can consider as bounded contexts. Grouping these capabilities together in these bounded contexts become fa uh, fantastic places to actually draw your service boundaries. The reason for this is what do we react to most often? A business person comes in and says, I want to either add a new business feature or change an existing business feature. If my services are grouped around bounded context in my business domain, you are significantly more likely to have a change impacting only one system. So when you have arbitrary technical slices, these horizontal slices, changes ripple across systems. The more you can group your services around bounded contexts, Groups of similar capability, sounds a lot like high cohesion, the better off you're going to be. So model these services based on the business domain, your lives will be better off. And if people are looking to take a big system and make it a small system, that's the thing you need to start doing. Understand your domain and understand your business, the bounded context, and find your seams based on that. Even once you've defined your seam, you start separating these services out, you've got to think about how those services talk to each other. Because that's another point of where you can have services that become overly coupled, that then are hard to change independently of each other. Remember, we want to be able to change services independently of each other to make our releases small, and to be able to make them frequently, and to be able to do them in a risk, uh, in, in a well-managed way. So let's imagine I've got my music shop, and, and it's talking to the recommendation library. Now, if I make a one-line change, but don't change the semantics of the interface, and I don't change the, the nature of the interface itself, so for example, I make the one-line change to stop Silverchair equaling uh, Peter Andre, then you know this internal change doesn't change the interface. The music shop just carries on like before, doesn't really care that anything's changed. If I add some new methods 
to my recommendation system that my music shop doesn't care about. Maybe I add a few new methods that, uh, that for a future release of a client. Again, music shop doesn't care. It can still call the old methods semantically, they're the same, you still make the same calls, everything happens, it's great. But if I make a more fundamental change to that interface that breaks, I also need to release a new version of the music shop that can also consume that new version of my service interface. This becomes a change that ripples out. So how can we avoid that problem? Well, really, wherever possible, you want non-breaking changes in the interface. That means you need to think carefully about your interfaces. I am not a fan of big upfront design. I am a fan of getting around a whiteboard when you're going to have a services and working through lots of scenarios because it's a damn sight easier to change a whiteboard diagram than it is a load of systems that are talking to each other. So where possible, you want to try and avoid these breaking changes and these, you want non-breaking expansion changes that to be preferred. But if you can't, there are other things you can do that are fairly common sense. The first thing is build a versioning scheme in on the first version of your service. So if you need to introduce a breaking change, so imagine my recommender now wants to release a new version of the library that's better fit uh, of the interface that's better fit for purpose for mobile devices. They're free to do so. Out comes version two. Coexist the two versions of your interface. I can then deploy my iOS application, for example, which can use that version two endpoint. And I don't have to redeploy the music shop at the same time. At some point in the future, I can then repoint the music shop to that new version two endpoint. So here I've been able to take a big change, which is a breaking change to an endpoint, and I've phased it. I've rolled out the new endpoint. I've then given my consumers time to move over before retiring the old endpoint. So if you need to make breaking changes, version them and coexist them because then you can manage your releases more elegantly. Also, you really need to be very careful about any shared code. So here's one of the patterns that I used very early on with a system I worked on. I don't claim to be brilliant. I just make mistakes like everybody else. But we, had, uh, we thought, OK, we've got our things modeled around a business domain. And we've, so we took all of our business domain objects and we made them a shared library because it was a broadband um, system, provisioning system. So we took all these shared common domain object concepts and bundled them up into a shared jar file. And we then, when, when service A wants to talk to service B, it would serialize. It would take the in, object, uh, in memory state, take that as an object, serialize it, send it over the wire. And service B would then unpack it and go, yes, that looks good. Now I know what to do with all that stuff. And then we went and released service, new version of service A with a different version of the shared library. Um, can I send that object over the wire? Don't know. Maybe. It'd be fun to find out, won't it? Um, this is a real problem, right? Because as developers, we are trained to obey dry. Don't repeat yourself. We abhor duplicated code. And so we do things like share code. And when you share code that leaks over a process boundary across a service interface like this, you introduce a potential source of coupling. What you actually want to do is only expose what you need to expose. And if I had to choose in this sort of situation, I'd rather have duplicated code in two services than a shared library that is used in exchange between services because it becomes coupling. So it's hard to get your head around. Trust me. So be very, very careful about shared serialization protocols, especially using techniques like WSDL binding, evil, JAXB, and Java serialization. All of these technologies, I mean, even things like protobufs, which theoretically have more support for changing versions, are a shared serialization protocol that can be broken very easily. And often when you're sharing code, you're often sharing concepts between services that don't really need to know about each other. If I'm taking all the domain objects I know about 
and all the domain objects Christian knows about, and we're blending them all together in one big thing, we're just passing this thing around. That's not what a bounded context is. A bounded context is I only need the shopping basket bounded context. I know everything about shopping baskets. Couldn't care less about what's happening in the warehouse, the finance system. So another thing you should listen to here, which is RSC 761. Now, I know all of you read the RSCs whenever they come out. Every week, you rush down to your news agents, pick up the latest RSC. I, I'm, not, I'm going to spare you your blushes. Uh, I, I'd ask Christian, I'm sure he'd know. But RSC 761 is the TCP IP uh, specification. And in it, there was a, a line uh, from John Postel, which became known as Postel's Law, or the Robustness Theorem, which says, be conservative in what you do, be liberal in what you expect. Now, this actually is a kind of useful piece of advice when thinking about services. And the way we apply this to services is, if I get a payload from somebody, I'm not going to do things like be really like, rigid and bind to every single field in the payload I get back. I'm just going to pull out the two or three bits of information I care about. So if I get a big XML document coming back, I'm not going to bind to every field. I'm going to use XPath to pull out the pieces of information that are pertinent to me. Why? Well, if anything else in the XML document changes and I don't care about it, I shouldn't get broken. This actually leads us to often to when we're working with Whistle services to use XPath to bind the X, to pull stuff out of the payload rather than binding to every field. This actually reduces the chance you're going to get broken. So these are all techniques to avoid the problem or at least try and delay how long it will be before you break one of your consumers. But how can you actually pick up the fact you might get broken, you might break your consumers when you're making changes before you deploy your software even? Remember, we want to make it, we want to manage the risk, we want to make it easy to make the change and therefore we want to make it low risk. There's a concept uh, called consumer-driven contracts that can really help here. So let's imagine I've got my music shop and my recommendation system and they have a service that they talk over. And this service is effectively, maybe it's within a team. We've talked about what this API is going to be, or maybe it's two separate teams have created this. You come up with a service API and you talk about what it's going to do and how the service is going to behave. <coughs> with consumer-driven contracts, that conversation, you effectively encode it as a test. And the music shop, the consumer, defines their expectation on how the recommendation system behaves as a test. That test, or series of tests, is then run as part of the continuous um, integration system or the build pipeline of the recommendation service. So every time the recommendation service makes a change, they run the test that was written by their consumers. And if they break that test, they know they have introduced a change that's going to break their consumers. And at that point, they can stop and say, hang on, we've either got to fix that problem or we've got to go talk to our consumers and explain that something's going to happen. That can all be done in line as part of your build. And this will get picked up if we ever get to production. And you can think about this test as just a codification of a conversation you probably had with a person who designed this for you. So that's a very good way of catching these problems before they occur in production. So we're, we're about 30 odd minutes in and I've done the easy stuff. Um, yeah. So um, databases. Uh, yeah. So as we all know, how many people here are data scientists? I didn't see any fixed wheel bikes outside, so, or, and there don't seem to be too many ironic haircuts. So I'm guessing there aren't any data scientists in there. There's Nathan. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, data science is cool because data's cool, right? We like data. Um, data's great. I'm not sure why, but it's great. Data's very, very popular. The problem is databases are evil things. Um, you know, they're, they're painful to work with. Um, and, you know, they're getting better. I mean, some of you probably have the luxury of not having to work with some of the relational databases where the schema is encoded in the data store itself and some of the NoSQL stores where you don't have an enforced schema it can be easier to work with from a development point of view, but there are still some very problematic challenges when dealing with services and service-based systems and databases. So at this point, we've lost one person already. So he's gone off now and he's going to go home tonight and he's going to go and split his service apart. And because Sam told me to, and I now know not to split it across a horizontal line, so I'm going to make it a bounded context. He's read the second half of the Eric Evans book, that's great. And he splits it apart. 
It does this, which is the commonest service oriented integration pattern that you can possibly find, which is called database integration. It's fantastic. So the music shop is maybe asking recommenders for things over its service API, and it's getting the recommendations back, and that's all great, but they both share the same schema. They might both be reading and writing for different, part, same, different parts of the schema, or same parts of the schema, but ultimately, the same schema underpins both services. Very, very common. This is also a very simple example. The worst system I worked on had over 40 services on the same database. We only found out about half of them when we turned the database off and waited for the phone calls. I wish that wasn't true. Um, challenges here. You want to make a change, and you want to manage the impact of that change and make it quick to make the change. Now, if I change something to do with the music shop behavior, I may well want to change the schema. I might want to manipulate that schema. I might want to refactor that schema in some way to better support the new functionality of the music shop. Can I do that safely? Kind of not sure now, am I? Because what about the recommendation system? I might break him. In nearly all situations where this happens, nobody ever does anything to the database other than add stuff. Because they're too scared to do anything else. Effectively, the database has become like a big open API. It's very tightly binds two services together. It never gets changed. It's a huge sort of source of debt and legacy. If you find this, in many, if not most of the situations, often the safest thing to do is to combine the services back up together and start again, teasing these things apart. So, if there's only one thing you're going to take away from this talk, don't do this, please. Especially, not, don't, especially don't do this then hire us, that'd be really bad. Right, this is what you want, okay? It could even be the same database instance, that's absolutely fine, you don't, it's not a hardware issue but you need to separate the schemas. Effectively, you need to have, as a service, complete control over your own data ownership. You should have control over what system that's stored in, the technology being used, the way it's structured, the way the recommendation system might want to store its data to deliver its quality of service might be fundamentally different to the music shop. Each service needs to own its own data and how that's stored. This actually frees you up to do some more interesting things. For those of you that right now that might have a big monolithic system and a very big complicated database, the prospect of introducing Mongo or Neo4j as a backing store will be quite scary because that's a big change to make. What you could actually do is start looking for seams in your system to separate out services and changing that bounded context data store. It's a way of managing your risk and your transition into a new technology. So in this world, I might have a relational database management system backing both of these systems. Let's imagine it's MySQL. But the recommendation system could say, you know what, for the kinds of services we offer, we're going to be much better off with, say, React. And they could make that change, and it would be completely transparent to the outside world as long as the service boundary, the service interface, is semantically unchanged. It's actually a really nice pattern I saw around this. There's a presentation um, by Creston from a company called Trifork in Denmark at the uh, GoTo conference. I think it was GoTo 2011. The video is probably up. And they did a system for the Danish medical records um, uh, system in, in, um, in Denmark, weirdly enough. Um, and they were actually moving towards React because it gave them some specific benefits around site outage. Key thing is, if I go into a pharmacy, I still need to have my records available, even though the link might be down to, say, the central um, Copenhagen hospital. And so what they did, I mean, this pattern writ large is, how do I incrementally change a backing store? I came up with a really elegant way of handling this. First thing is, we're going to bring up our new backing store. Let's imagine it's React. And the first release, we're going to write all of our data to both data stores. OK, so I'm going to write to both places. So I'm reading from the relational data management system, but I'm writing to both. This allows me to understand how does React perform? Is it working OK? What's the load look like on my system? But ultimately, if it falls over in hell and handcart, the customer's never going to notice because I'm reading and writing. And the main read and write is coming from the, our old database. The second release, 
I'm still writing to my old database, but I'm now reading from React. Any problems at this point, I can roll back, no data lost. And only when that was we were happy with that did they actually retire the old database management system. So they made three, by making those three steps, they, gave, they, they allowed them to introduce small incremental change, manage that change, manage the risk of that change, and also gave them rollback points. And they were able to make an incremental journey, and it was quite a big shift. And you can do this with services too. So imagine I've got my uh, recommendation library, and Sam Brightspark decides to write my, rewrite my 45,000 line Java program in six lines of Clojure, um, as would be possible because Clojure is awesome. So here's the a suggest library now written in Clojure. Um, but I'm, I'm untrustworthy. It's this, it's this newfangled language based on something called Lisp that's only been around since 1953, and I don't trust it. So I think, OK, how am I going to test this? Well, why not send load of my recommendations to both services in production, but only read back the responses from my old service? I can bring the new service up. I can check the logs. I can check the performance of that system as it's running, get happy that it's doing what I expect, that it's operating within the tolerances that I want, and when I'm ready, I can make the switch. Exactly the same pattern. Some examples here of what's called dark launching. Facebook did this, actually, with their chat systems. I can't remember if it's in the book or not, um, but what they did was they were launching a brand new chat system, and Facebook operates at a fairly high level of scale, you know, as you might expect, lots of, lots of teenagers out there. Uh, and they want to chat away. You know, launching a chat service is by nature an asynchronous communication mechanism. They have scaling issues, those sorts of things. So what they did was they brought up the underlying chat infrastructure and started putting JavaScript payloads into some of the pages that were sent out to um, Facebook users to send fake chat messages over the system. You didn't see it, but there was messages going on. They could test that it was working OK, that the loads were happy. And then when they were ready, they could release the UI to expose that to the users. I mentioned at the beginning, earlier on, this concept of separating the deployment of the software from the release of the software. Dart launching is another way of doing that. So you could do it with database, you could do it with services, or if you're Facebook, with chat services. So in summary, by decomposing your systems, you can actually make it easier for you to make those changes and deploy those changes independently of having to redeploy your entire system. Lower risk changes that are faster to make allow you to release features more quickly to your customers. Big monolithic systems, scary to change long cycles. But when decomposing your systems, you need to do this by looking at the domain, your business domain. Understand your bounded context. Spend time at the whiteboard. Spending time on upfront design when looking at how services talk to each other, between each other, is really important. Good architecture is actually much more like town planning than it is about architecture. How many of you played SimCity? You know, in SimCity, you say that's a light industrial area, that's a residential area, I've got a commercial area over here. You don't really care what buildings get made, but you're very careful about the roads between them and the power lines. This is the same thing. Upfront care and attention to how your services talk to each other, because that's the thing that's hard to change and can lead to coupling. So get those interfaces right. And don't worry too much about duplicating code. In general, stick to text-based interchange if you can. REST is fantastic. It doesn't have to be fully RESTful services. Binary serialization protocols are rarely justified in the name of performance. And find ways to separate deployment from release. Talked about circuit breakers, asynchronous deployment, stark launching. It's all different ways of separating the deployment of a new piece of functionality from actually releasing it to your users. Um, that note, I just want to, I think we've got, just to say we are hiring, by the way. If anyone's interested in a career at ThoughtWorks, come find me. I've been here nine years, so I'm either deranged or happy. And if I'm happy, you want to find out why. So come find me afterwards if you want to know.